I'm back in 2 Kings 19, looking at King Hezekiah. And he's just got done praying to the Lord. And, you know, he was all in turmoil about the words of Rabshakeh and the king of Assyria. And he goes to the right place. He goes to the Lord. He spreads out the letter that he was given in front of the Lord and says, basically says, Lord, you deal with this. And he brags on the Lord. In verse 15, he tells him, Thou hast made heaven and earth. And he says, Save thou us out of his hand. You see, he's going to the right place. Then you get to verse 20. And here comes Isaiah. It says, Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, that which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. Isn't that amazing that the God who made everything, the God who knew Adam and Eve, the God who talked to Moses face to face, the God who was a friend with Abraham, is your friend too. And he'll talk to you. Why in the world would God want to talk to us? But he talks to Hezekiah. He it says, Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, which isn't the Amos of the minor prophet. This is a different Amos. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God. Imagine getting a message from God Almighty himself. You got a message from God Almighty himself. 66 books. 66 love letters from God himself is what you have in your lap. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, that which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. So it's against Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. So it's a imprecatory prayer. He wasn't praying for him. He was praying against him. And Sennacherib was worthy of a imprecatory prayer because he's a bad dude. He's a type of the Antichrist. And the and he's not strong as he thinks he is. It's that the Lord's using him to judge nations. The Lord's using him to judge Israel. The Lord's using him to do all these things. It's not that he's strong in his own strength. Then it says in verse 21, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. So the Lord himself has a word concerning Sennacherib. And it says, the virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee. Notice it calls, it says the virgin, the daughter of Zion. It calls her a virgin. And this shows you Israel's standing versus Israel's state. You know how me and you as born-again believers, we've got our standing, but we've also got our state. You know, my standing in the Lord is perfect and as righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ. When God sees me, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But my state, on the other hand, that's a different story. My state as how I'm living at any given moment. Now, as a saved person, your state isn't always good. Sometimes you have a really bad day when it comes to sin. But your standing is always good. And your state doesn't affect your standing. You, can't, you don't lose your salvation because of your state. But you, what you want to do is you want to try your hardest to get your state to match your standing as close as you possibly can. So it says, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at thee. So it calls her a virgin. Let me show you why. God can call them a virgin even though she has been in consistent spiritual 
adultery, but yet he can still call her a virgin. Look at Numbers 23, 21. Numbers 23 and verse 21. It says, He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. So you see that? He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Just like with you. You got saved, and he's not imputing sin to you anymore. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. It said, He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. That's how that the Lord can look at the daughter of Zion, the virgin, the daughter of Zion, and call her a virgin. That's how. Because he's choosing not to behold their iniquity. They've got that covenant with him. Now, when it comes to their state, They've been in bad shape. When it comes to their standing, that's a different story. You think about them today. Look at Israel's state today. It's bad. They're blind. But they're beloved for the Father's sake. So that's their standing versus their state. It says, The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. They laughed him to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Let's look at some verses for this. It says they laughed thee to scorn. Talking about they've laughed at the king of Assyria. Job 5.22 It says in Job 5.22 At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. You know, you got this threat of this king of Assyria. This army that's just destroyed everybody else. And then he's coming to destroy you. And you just laugh. Because you know you got God on your side. And if God be for you, who can be against you? So that's why I sent and laughed thee to scorn. Look at Psalm... 59.8 Psalm 59 and verse 8 It says, But thou, O Lord, sh shalt laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. You see these feeble people that are against the Lord and they think they're so much stronger than God's people, stronger than the Lord. That's laughable. He's going to laugh them to scorn. He's going to laugh at their calamity. He's going to mock when their fear cometh. You know, they laughed him to scorn when he was going to hear, heal Jairus' daughter. But the tables are going to turn one of these days. You, you, they laughed him to scorn. They're going to, he's going to laugh them to scorn. Scorn is, if you look up the de definition, it's extreme contempt. It says, that disdain which brings which springs from a person's opinion of the meanness of an object and a conscious, consciousness or belief of his own superiority or worth. So they laugh the Lord Jesus Christ to scorn. When it comes right down to it, he's going to laugh them to scorn. And he says, The virgin, the daughter, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. You know, they came wagging their heads when Jesus Christ was on the cross. The shoe's going to be on the other foot. He's going to come down out of the clouds, and he's going to be shaking his head at them. You should have got right with the Lord. You should have got saved. Verse 22. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Saying this to Sennacherib. Who have you reproached? And blasphemed. Well, he's done that to the Lord. And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? So, him going against, 
Hezekiah and Judah, that was like him going against the Lord. As the Antichrist will do in the tribulation. This is aimed at Sennacherib, but it, it's history, but it's prophecy. The same thing is going to happen again. Sennacherib is a picture of the Antichrist. What's the Antichrist going to do? He's going to blaspheme. In Revelation 13, 2 Thessalonians 2, you're going to see him open his mouth and blasphemy. Over in 2 Thessalonians 2, he's going to go into the temple claiming to be God. Revelation 13, you see he gets that deadly head wound, resurrects to counterfeit the Lord Jesus, and he's going to blaspheme his name. And it says, against whom hast thou exalted thy voice? What did the devil want to do? He said, I want to be like the Most High. And lifted up thine eyes on high. You see, if you want to go up, you got to come down. Sennacherib was going up, and he's going to go down. You know, you, you know, John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. So the way up is down. The more you try to go up, the more you're going to come down. He's trying to be lifted up. He's trying to exalt himself against the Holy One of Israel. There's no way that you can go against the Holy One of Israel. It says, By thy messengers thou hast reproached the Lord, and hast said with the multitude of my chariots, I am come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof, and the choice fir trees thereof, and I will enter into the lodgings of his borders, and into the forest of his caramel. Notice, he said, with the multitude of my chariots, I am come up to the heights of the mountains. What does that remind you of? That verse over there that says, some trust in chariots. And some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God, Psalm 20, verse 7. You know, so a lot of these people, they're just trusting in chariots. They're trusting in the weapons they got. They're trusting in everything else, and they have no God. But your chariots are nothing compared to God. Your false gods are nothing compared to God. He said, he said by thy messengers, thou hast reproached the Lord. You know, they got their messengers running around with this message, blaspheming the name of God, saying, with the multitude of our chariots, we're going to come up to the heights of the mountains. What does that remind you of? Reminds me of Isaiah 14, 14, where the devil said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Over there in Isaiah 14, in verse 14, that chapter describing the devil's main problem. You know what he said? In Isaiah 14, 13, the Lord told him, he said, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He said, I'll be like the most high. What's, well, what's Sennacherib, top of the Antichrist, saying? He's saying, with the multitude of my chariots, I'm a, I am come up to the height of the mountains. The, all the chariots and his army and all this stuff has got him puffed up, just like the devil was puffed up. He said, I've come up to the heights of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon. Kind of reminds you of sides of the north. And will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof. You know, men are pictured as trees. You know, over there in Mark 8, 24, the man said, I see men as trees walking, and trees picture kings and princes and nobles in the Bible. So he's saying, I'll cut down the tall cedar trees thereof and the choice fir trees thereof. You know, he's just going to kill all the kings and princes, and he's going to be the one. He's going to be the greatest. That's what it's all about. That's what it all goes back to is somebody wants to be the greatest. Somebody wants to have a throne. He says, I will enter into the lodgings of his borders and into the forest of his carmel. 
you remember Carmel, that's where Elijah was when he killed the 400, uh, 450 prophets of Baal. Then you go on to verse 24. He says, I have digged and drunk strange waters. He says, I have digged and drunk strange waters. And with the sole of my feet, have I dried up all the rivers of besieged places. Notice the I have, I've done with the sole of my foot. Have I dried up all the rivers of besieged places? All about him, all about what he's done, so puffed up, all about him over and over. So he's digged. He's done some work. You know, being extremely evil is a lot of work. Just like, you know, you work hard about your Christian service. You work hard because you want to do good at the judgment seat of Christ. You work hard because you love the Lord. Well, you got people like the king of Assyria who's working really hard at being evil. Amos 9.2 talks about people that dig into hell. Some people are working really hard getting to hell. It's like they're heaping up treasure for the last days. They're going to be rewarded of their evil. Philippians 3.2 talks about evil workers. You know, the devil can't use a lazy guy any more than the Lord can use a lazy guy. So the devil wants a good worker. And this king of Assyria, he's definitely a worker. He says, I have digged and drunk strange waters. And with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of besieged cities. You think about that dried up all the rivers of besieged cities. You know, he's came into a place, and he's besieged it. He's got his army around it and camped around it, and then dried up the water, cut off their water supply, cut off their food supply, and so that they, if they don't come out to be killed, they just starve. So he's done going around trying to conquer, Con trying to go around conquering and to conquer, just like the Antichrist is going to do as it says in Revelation 6. And he's an evil worker. And, he, and it says in verse 25, now the Lord talking here, he says, Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it? How? And of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. Notice, you know, you got over there in Isaiah 14 where the devil's got those five I wills and I will be this, I will be that. And then you get over in Ezekiel 28 and the Lord's got some I wills. And he says, I'm going to do this to you. Or I will do this and I will do that. Now, Sennacherib had his I'm this and I'm that. Now look what the Lord comes back with. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have formed it? He says, hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it and of ancient times? That I have formed it, now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. He's like, Sennacherib, the only reason you're able to do this is because I'm letting you do it. It ain't because of your chariots. It's not because you're tough. It's not because you're a good evil worker. It's because I'm allowing you to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. I'm allowing you to do it as a judgment on people. That's the only reason you're able to do it. It's because I'm using you as a puppet. You're my rod. That's the only reason the devil's allowed to hurt me is because God's allowing him to do it to prove me and test me and try me or judge my flesh. Whatever he needs to do, he'll use the enemy as a rod to do things. And that's all he's doing with the king of Sennacherib. The king of, or the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria thinks that he's he's just so tough and he's He's doing this because he's so great. No, it's because the Lord who formed heaven and earth, the Lord who's the ancient of days, he's allowing you to do it. That's the only reason why. And you know, the Lord, you think about this, the Lord is saying all these words about Sennacherib, but is there 
I, I don't I don't know if there's a record anywhere that records that Sennacherib even ever heard these words. He's not saying this to Sennacherib. Right here, Isaiah's saying this. If you go back some verses there in verse 20, it says, Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying... So, uh, Hezekiah is hearing all this. I don't see a record that Sennacherib ever, ever, ever even hears it. So, this shows you that you could be in danger of something that's in the Scriptures... But you refused, you refused to read the scriptures. So you don't even know what's going to happen. You don't even know what you need to know that the Lord wants you to know. Because you won't read the scriptures. Just like Sennacherib's got all this stuff said about him and he doesn't even know about it. So that shows you need to read the scriptures. Sennacherib never, may never even hear about this word that the Lord gives. But you've got access to the word and you need to hear it. It says... In verse 25, the Lord says, Now have I brought it to pass. So the Lord is the one who brought it to pass. He allows the Assyrian to do what he does. He's going to allow the devil to do what he does. He's going to allow the Antichrist to do what he does. It's not because they're great. It's not because they're tough. It's because the Lord allows it. You know, anything that you do that's good, it's because God did it through you. Anything that you did that was bad, that took a lot of physical strength or took a lot of talent God allowed you to do it nobody's better than anybody you know you think about uh, you got out of bed this morning and somebody else didn't it's not because you're better than them it's because God gave you the strength to get out of bed you think about a great athlete that's making millions of dollars in the NBA it's not because he's better it's because the Lord allowed him to be born with that natural ability. The Lord allowed him to be able to go to practice. The Lord allowed all these opportunities to open. But he didn't allow any of that for somebody else. That doesn't mean they're better. It's because the Lord's just letting that happen. So nobody's better than anybody. It's God that's good. God... Uh, in verse 26, it says, Therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and as the green herb or as the grass on the housetops and as corn blasted before it be grown up. You see, God allowed the inhabitants of those places that the king of Assyria took over. He allowed those places to become weak. God allowed those places to become afraid so that the Assyria could have their way with those people. You know, God could have easily gave each of their men the strength of a thousand men and made it impossible for the king of Assyria to take over. But he didn't. He, he made them of small power. He made them dismayed and confounded. And as the grass of the field. And, he, and the Lord says in verse 27, But I know thy abode. He knows where you live. He knows where you live. He knows where your house is. You ever heard somebody say, you know, uh, somebody's smarting off to them or something, and they say, man, I know where you live. You better watch out. I know where you live. I know where you reside. The Lord says, but I know thy abode. He says, and thy going out and thy coming in and thy rage against me. God knows and keeps track of everything about you and your enemy. God knows everything about the biggest God-hater on this planet. And God says, I know your rage against me. God sees raged against it, the rage against his people as if it's rage against him. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You know, he was persecuting the church of God and wasting it. And you, you persecute the church. God sees that as you're persecuting him. When you persecuted Israel in the Old Testament, God sees that as you're persecuting him. He says, But I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me. Because thy rage against me, and thy tumult has come up into mine ears. And you know, since God is not through with Israel, you know, if you, if the, the nations that mess with Israel, 
you're they're messing with God too because God's not through with Israel. They're still going to get the land. He says, because thy rage against me and thy tumult is come up into mine ears. That's the commotion and disturbance. All that stuff Rabshakeh was saying. That's come up into his ears. He's heard it all. He says, therefore, I will put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips. And I will turn thee back by the way, turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. You're going to go back where you came from. He's going to put his hook in their nose and bridle on their lips. Because he's just been leading them, leading them around like a puppet anyway. And he can put a hook in their nose and bridle in their lips and lead them back the other way. You know, all they are is puppets on a string. Being led by a hook in the nose and a bridle. They're God's puppets, that's all they are. He says, and this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves. So now Isaiah is telling what Hezekiah, Isaiah is telling Hezekiah what the Lord's saying. And he's saying to Hezekiah, and this shall be a sign unto thee. You know, the Jews require a sign. First Chronicles or First Corinthians one twenty two. He says, You shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves. He's saying, Don't worry about this Sennacherib guy. I, I got him under my pinky. He's nothing. And he's, he's saying to Hezekiah, don't even worry about it because this year you're going to eat such things as grow themselves. And in the second year, that which springeth of the same, you're going to be here still the second year. And in the third year, sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. So he's saying, you know, you're going to be here this year. You're going to be here next year. You're going to be here a third year. Then he says in verse 30, And the remnant that has escaped to the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Now that, uh, you see that word remnant? It, you know, I've told you words put you in a certain context prophetically. That word remnant will put you in a context prophetically in the tribulation because there's going to be a Jewish remnant saved in the tribulation also, you got the Sennacherib, king of Assyria, atop of the Antichrist. And here you got a remnant that's escaped of the house of Judah. Shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant. And they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. So this remnant here pictures the Jewish remnant of the tribulation. And it's the zeal of the Lord of hosts that does this. You know, you see somebody that's very zealous for something and how much work they accomplish and how much great things they do. Imagine the zeal of the Lord of hosts doing a thing. Imagine the Lord himself determining to do a thing. It's going to come to pass. There, so he says in verse 32, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. You know, if you, like, cast a bank against it, take a bunch of dirt, and pile it on top of more dirt until you got enough dirt to get up over the wall into the city. He's not coming into this city. He's not going to be able to shoot an arrow. He's not going to come in with a shield. Because the Lord won't allow it. Just like over there in Revelation 20, at the end of the millennium, the devil is going to get an army as a sand of the sea when he gets released out of the bottomless pit. And when they try to come in there to fight Jerusalem, the Lord's just going to have a fire come down from heaven and devour them. He's not even going to be able to shoot an arrow in there. He says in verse 33, By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. That's where you get the saying, He's going back where he came from. And shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. Picture of the millennium, the devil not getting in. He says, for I will defend this city to save it. For mine own sake and for my servant David, David's sake. You know, God does stuff for David's sake, just like he saved me and you for Jesus' sake. You know, David is the 
standard for the kings. You know, all the kings are compared to David, just like Jesus Christ is a standard for us. And we don't compare. Just like most of the kings don't compare to David. But the Lord says, I'll defend this city to save it. Psalm 94, 22 says, the Lord is my defense. Or, that may be Isaiah 31, 5. Let me make sure I'm giving you. I think I gave you the wrong reference there. Isaiah 31, 5. Yeah, Isaiah 31, 5 says, as birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. It says in Psalm 94, 22, but the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. Over in uh, Nehemiah 4.20, it says, Our God shall fight for us. So it's God fighting for you. If God's fighting for you, Sennacherib can't get you. The devil won't. The Antichrist won't. They may be able to hurt your flesh, but they can't take your soul. It says in verse... 35 and it came to pass that night that's a, that the angel of the lord went out and smote in the camp of the assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand and when they arose early in the morning behold there were all dead corpses so the angel of the lord here and most times when you uh, i hear people refer to this as just a regular angel but it seems like, you know, just like the when you see the angel of the Lord uh, in the Old Testament, that's a pre-appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an angel of the Lord, like an appearance of the Lord. Jesus Christ, a pre-appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And, you know, an angel of the Lord, uh, angels in the Bible, what do they look like? A male. Just looks like a regular man. That's why you can entertain them unawares. Angels in the Bible are men, so you got this guy, probably looks like a 33-year-old male coming down and killing a hundred, four score, a score is 20, so you got four score, that'd be 80, a hundred, four score, and 5,000. So 185,000 people of Assyria, this angel of the Lord takes out, and when they arose early in the morning, you know, the ones that were left, that didn't get killed when they arose early in the morning, behold, there were all dead corpses. So, you know, the Lord's going to fight for you just like he fought for them. Now, this angel of the Lord seems like, seems like that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He came down and killed 185,000 men. And one night, he smote them. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. So you see, the king of Assyria wasn't one of those 185,000 men, so he departed. He ran off with his tail between his legs and went and returned just like the Lord said he would do. Just like it said, he shall not come into this city by the way that he came, by the same shall he return. So he returns and dwelt at Nineveh. Remember, that's who uh, Jonah didn't want to go preach to. And it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his God. That's the problem. He's got the wrong God. And it says that Adramelech and Sharezer, his son, smote him with the sword. So his own, he's back there worshiping his, worshiping his false God. And in comes his sons. And they smite him with the sword. And then they escaped into the land of Armenia. And Esar Haddon, his son, reigned in his stead. N uh, Nisroch means the unseen God. And what you got is a picture of the devil, the unseen God of this world. So that's 2 Kings 19. And next time, we'll pick back up in chapter 20.